Excellencies, fellow historians, ladies and gentlemen, it's an honor and pleasure to be with you here today. And uh, I look forward to hearing uh, learned lectures on an important topic, uh, the Arctic, the High North, Iceland's strategic position uh, since the Second World War, throughout the Cold War, and the present era. Now, uh, we are living in times of tension. It's an era of aggression and anxiety, and we must act accordingly. Having said that, uh, always be a bit wary when heads of state say that we must do this or that. And also be a bit wary when historians claim that history proves this or that. But what then about the convergence of a historian and a head of state? I'm not the first one. I'm probably, or hopefully not the last one, but uh, I'm tempted to quote the wisdom of the French philosopher and historian Henri Per, that historians would make the best national leaders. But having said that, and notice I've said having said that twice now in the beginning, and that is my academic curse. I, I always see the other point of view. I always... Who was it? I'm not comparing myself to U.S. presidents, but it was uh, Harry Truman who said, give me a one-armed advisor. I've had enough of this on the one hand, on the other hand. <laughs> so having said that, having quoted Henri Baer about historians being the best national leaders, I quote also uh, the Italian historian, uh, Benedetto Croce, who said on the eve of the Second World War, that uh, most historically oriented leaders invoke a canon of simple, often outdated and distorted historical knowledge to increase their legit legitimacy. And I'll come back to that uh, later on. But uh, I'm not going to talk for long. I'm going to listen at this seminar. Just a few teasers, as it were. Uh, we'll begin, I hope and assume, during the Second World War. And, uh, you know, you can Google this. It's on the internet. But Churchill said, he described Iceland as the unsinkable aircraft carrier. And also, if we are to believe what we read online, that whoever held Iceland held a pistol or could hold a pistol aimed at uh, England, Canada and America. So the strategic importance of this island in the middle of the North Atlantic was uh, uh, clear. And that was also the case during the Cold War. It's a complex story, but Iceland was considered a vital link in the Western chain of defenses from Greenland to the UK and beyond, the Greenland-Iceland-UK gap. Uh, this, of course, uh, affected Icelandic society, uh, Icelandic politics in, in <coughs> numerous ways, and also gave Iceland a leverage. Because if you're important, you have leverage. Iceland is an island in the middle of the North Atlantic uh, without an army, without a navy. And there's not that many of us. It's me, the ambassador. <laughs> Around 400,000 people now. According to the National Registry, we just crossed the 400,000 mark, but then there was a recalculation and we're still under 400,000. <laughs> also, one of the youngest nations on Earth. Uh, only the island itself, only around 16 million years old. But we're adding to it every minute. Now we're anxious. Now we're anxiously awaiting the next volcanic eruption and pray that uh, 
not much damage will be done, not to mention that we must do all we can to avoid the loss of life. But Iceland is safe, Iceland is still there. And back to, back to the subject of today. The Cold War increased Iceland's leverage, as I said, and that served us well during another dispute, uh, which I'm tempted to mention here. Being a historian, being an expert on one particular subject, the fishing disputes between Iceland and Britain in the second half of the 20th century, the so-called Cod Wars. Uh, a complex conflict evolving fisheries jurisdiction and to connect it with the Cold War, the Icelanders would pick up the phone, call Washington and say, unless you pressure the British to back down, we will call Moscow. And the Icelanders will uh, unite against NATO. They will want to shut down the US military base at Keflavik. And do you really want that for a, for a few fillets of cod? So the Cold War and the Cod War were closely connected. And the Cold War, in this sense, uh, I'm tempted to say, uh, benefited Iceland. It increased your leverage. If you're important, your power increases. But then everything changed. Collapse of the Soviet Union in 1991. And in the early 2000s, I was a young academic and wrote a short article on Iceland and Iceland in uh, the international system and quoted an unnamed NATO official who said that strategically, Iceland was on the edge of nowhere. But those words have not aged that well. Uh, if that was the case, it was a short exception because uh, the uh, lull has expired. And others will speak in more detail about that here and now. But in conclusion, uh, I want to come back to history and the use of history. Why are we doing this? Why are we looking back? Why are we trying to, to uh, learn from the past? A recent and stark example would be Vladimir Putin's uh, use or abuse of history in, uh, in the present. Uh, according to him, the Ukrainians are not really a separate nation. And history demonstrates that uh, uh, Russia has every right to control territories uh, far and wide uh, in that part of the world. And you, your most recent example, or the most recent example uh, I can think of, is uh, Tucker Carlson's interview with Putin uh, earlier this year. In 1654, Carlson managed to sneak in at that monologue in after 16, 17 minutes or so, when Putin had gone on and on about the historical reasons behind uh, Russia's aggression today. And Putin also is a keen reader of history and uh, uh, uses history to unify or attempt to unify his people. If you're not with me, you're against me. If you are not supporting this particular version of history, you are wrong. And this is the message of an authoritarian leader who uses history to his own, for his own purposes. Another, and I'm not putting this in a, in a, in a funny light, but another example would be a news item from last week. Last week, you could read in the Daily Mail uh, this headline. Putin launches war on Britain's fishermen. Russia signs off plan to ban UK trawlers from its cod and hattock rich waters and blasts the unscrupulous British for eating our fish for 68 years. And the subheading was, uh, government speaker in Moscow said ban will make Britain lose weight and get smarter. <laughs> this was a treaty between 
uh, the UK and the then Soviet Union in 1956 on limited rights for British trawlers to fish within 12 nautical miles in the Barents Sea. And uh, it was considered uh, a victory for Britain because that there were important fishing grounds there. But this was in 1956. So England or the UK uh, more or less recognized this 12 mile limit of Soviet of the Soviet coast. But two years later, Britain was ready to go to a war, admittedly a court war, with Iceland, which was declaring the same 12 mile limit. Now, why was that? Why do you accept 12 miles of the Soviet Union coast, but fight it of Iceland? Now, maybe remember what I said about Iceland being small, having no army, no navy, nothing to speak of. Because an official in the Foreign Office uh, stated in the summer of 1958, on the eve of the First Cold War, he wrote to Andrew Gilchrist, a very charismatic ambassador in Iceland at the time. Uh, he wrote, we negotiated with the Russians because we were not strong enough to enforce what we regard to be our right to fish anywhere in the high seas. But that didn't count in Iceland. As Andrew Gilchrist, uh, wrote eloquently about in his memoirs, uh, aptly named Court Wars and How to Lose Them. And I leave you with that and uh, look forward to hearing the, the talks that await us now. Thank you very much. <laughs>